Imagine the dawn of life on our planet when simple single-celled organisms first started to emerge, each one a bundle of potential, mutating and propagating its genetic code. Over time, this process of natural selection yielded great genetic diversity and ultimately intelligent life. The NEAT algorithm aims to mimic this process in order to train artificial neural networks to solve specific problems. In our case, the networks will learn to play Lunar Lander, an old arcade game where the objective is to land a rocket on the surface of the moon. But how exactly does it work? Let's dive in and find out. We'll start with the simplest possible architecture for the task at hand, a neural net consisting of nine input and two output nodes. The inputs will be the aircraft's position, velocity, angle, and contact sensors, plus an additional bias node, always set to one. The network's output nodes are few but crucial, representing the aircraft's vertical and horizontal thrust. In this most basic neural network, the only two edges connect the outputs with the bias node. Since the bias node is just a constant value of one, the aircraft actions are entirely independent of its environment. This is obviously a pretty poor choice of architecture, an issue that will be addressed once the cells start evolving. But before we look into that, we must understand how the current architecture of the network is expressed within the NEAT framework. The vertices of the network are represented by so-called node genes, they indicate which layer a given node belongs to. Additionally, there is one connection gene for each edge in the network. Each of these genes tells us which nodes are linked, the strength of their connection, and whether this connection is currently active. Each connection also has a unique innovation number. Think of it like a global patent number, which is granted once a new connection is discovered. If another network later evolves the same edge, its corresponding connection gene would bear the same innovation number. In the context of NEAT, the term genotype refers to the genetic makeup of a neural network, the set of all its node and connection genes. The phenotype, on the other hand, is how the network's structure is expressed, the graph representation, as well as the corresponding behavior. Now that we've got the terminology out of the way, let's see how these networks evolve. Just like in nature, random mutations can result in changes to the genetic code. They can affect the structure of the network in three ways. By far the most common is a change in the weight of a connection. The second possible mutation is the addition of a new connection, like the one forming between nodes 6 and 10. A less common mutation in the NEAT algorithm is the creation of a new node. During this operation, a node is inserted into an existing connection, effectively splitting it into two. This mutation happens rarely because the algorithm tries to seek out the most streamlined solution, prioritizing smaller, well-structured networks over bulkier ones. Now that we understand how new genes are introduced into the gene pool, let's zoom out and look at a small population of size 5, where each network was affected by different mutations. As can be seen by their phenotypes, the population has branched into two separate species. The first has evolved to have a hidden layer, whereas the second species displays a high interconnectivity between the input and output nodes. Each of these networks has a global fitness value that expresses their ability to land the aircraft in a controlled and fuel-efficient manner. The adjusted fitness, on the other hand, is equal to an individual's global fitness divided by the number of individuals in its species. Much like in nature, only the fittest individuals can survive and thus succeed in passing on their genes. Therefore, each generation Every species loses a certain percentage of their least fit individuals. In each species, the remaining individuals are then paired up and their genes are combined in a process called crossover. 
how many offsprings a given species can produce is proportional to the sum of its adjusted fitness values. When crossing over, the genes in both genomes with the same innovation numbers are lined up. These genes are called matching genes. Genes that do not match are either disjoint or excess, depending on whether they occur within or outside the range of the other parent's innovation numbers. Matching genes are inherited randomly from either parent. Disjoint genes and excess genes, on the other hand, are inherited from the fittest parent. In our case, the first parent has the higher fitness value, which is why all of his excess and disjoint genes are passed on to its offspring. And thus, new life is born, carrying genes from both parents, thereby enhancing the genetic diversity of the population. With our foundational understanding of the NEAT algorithm in place, it's now time to put it to the test. Let's initiate an actual simulation to observe its effectiveness in training neural networks to play Lunar Lander. First, let's create an initial population of size 150. Each of these little dots represents a neural network like the ones we've seen before. Whenever one of them glows in blue, it indicates a mutation has occurred. At this point, the differences in their genome are still rather small, so they all belong to the same species. Initially set with random weights, and after just one mutation, their fitness levels are quite low, ranging from minus 1600 to minus 85. To put it in perspective, a score of at least 200 is required to solve the lunar lander problem. For our purposes, the fitness levels are represented by colors. Red denotes a lower score, while green indicates a higher one. We will now eliminate the weakest 80%, leaving us with the fittest 30 individuals. The surviving individuals reproduce, giving rise to the next generation by collectively producing 150 offspring. Following this, the parent generation perishes, paving the way for the new generation to take over. We are now inside the second generation, meaning one iteration of the NEAT algorithm has passed, and the networks should be a tiny bit better at steering the aircraft. Let's test this hypothesis by looking at a random individual of the current population throughout this generation. Save for some minor changes to the weights of its connection genes, the individual's genome has remained unchanged from mutation. Yet again, there is not enough genetic diversity to warrant the creation of a new species. The fitness levels remain very low. There is even a slight decrease in the average fitness. But what does that mean for the individual's ability to solve the lunar lander problem? Let's watch and find out. As you may have already expected, the aircraft plummets uncontrollably from the sky, resulting in an unmitigated crash on the moon's surface. Remember, node zero is just a bias node. So until there is a mutation connecting its input to its output nodes, the network has no means of using information about its environment to guide its actions. Yet again, the less fortunate 80% of the population succumbs to the forces of natural selection. And once more, new life emerges as the remaining individuals reproduce, thereby paving the way for the next generation. Let us now fast forward to the 11th generation. Moving forward, the close-up view will always feature the fittest individual of each generation. After the usual mutation step, something interesting happens. A new species emerges, initially comprised of just two individuals. 
Let's see if there are any meaningful improvements regarding the network's performance. That doesn't seem to be the case, which is unsurprising given that there is not a single connection between input and the output nodes in this particular individual. To protect topological innovation, the NEAT algorithm ensures that new species are not eliminated prematurely. Let us now jump to generation 34, where another milestone is achieved. This generation is particularly interesting because it is the first time that one of the individuals has managed to score a positive fitness value. By now the individual has a total of five connection genes. Its strongest edge has a weight of 11.32 and connects the angle of the aircraft to its horizontal thrust. That indicates that the network has learned to balance itself out by applying thrust in the opposite direction of its tilt. The remaining connections are not as strong, but seem to be quite useful nonetheless. One of them links the position on the x-axis to the horizontal thrust, effectively allowing the aircraft to steer left and right. Other connections are a bit more dubious. For example, the one connecting the left leg of the aircraft to its horizontal thrust. Luckily, its weight is close to zero, so it doesn't have much of an impact on the aircraft's behavior. But enough with the talk. Let us see it in action. While it's not as impressive as one might have hoped, it's still a significant improvement over the previous generations. The lander is actively softening its fall by applying downward thrust and tilting itself to the right in order to reach the designated landing pad. However, it is still far from perfect, so let us now jump 67 generations ahead and see how the algorithm has progressed. As one can see straight away, the number of species has increased significantly. By now, some of them have developed their own strategy at playing the game, competing with Species 0, which has held the top spot for quite some time. Species 2, for example, recognizable by its triangular shape, shows a somewhat peculiar behavior. It prioritizes a quick arrival over a safe landing, letting itself fall from the sky and only applying thrust at the very last moment. An approach that is rewarded with a score slightly above zero. However, this behavior seems to be more of a lucky coincidence than a well thought out strategy. Looking at its phenotype, we can see that vertical thrust only gets applied when angular velocity increases. In other words, the aircraft slows its fall whenever it tilts out of control. Since the tilt tends to increase throughout the fall, the aircraft just happens to apply downward thrust at the right moment to dampen its landing. While this approach seems to be working surprisingly well, we sure can do better. In generation 150, Species 1 reigns supreme, breaking the all-time record with a fitness value of 70. It approaches the landing pad cautiously, carefully adjusting its position and velocity to ensure a safe landing. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite understand that the job is done once it has touched the moon's surface, so it keeps applying thrust. Since one leg keeps bouncing of the floor, the game doesn't register a successful landing and the time keeps ticking, negatively affecting the score. Over the course of the next generation, Species 1 will continue to refine its strategy, ultimately achieving a fitness value of 100 and soon thereafter, surpassing it to reach 203. That makes Species 1 the first to officially complete the game. So let's not waste any time and look at how it performs. It maneuvers the aircraft with precision, ensuring a safe landing near the pad. As can be seen here, 
ending on the landing pad is actually not strictly required, although it does help to achieve a higher score. Notably, the network applies thrust to the right side of the aircraft towards the end, likely to adjust its tilt. However, this action inadvertently prevents the aircraft from sliding onto the designated landing site. All in all, the network is way better than the ones we've started with, but there's still room for growth. We will now look at one last generation, Generation 348 to be precise, as it contains the very best individual that the algorithm has produced in a total of 400 iterations. Right out of the gate, one can see that Species Zero has displaced all others, and that the fittest individual is equipped with two hidden layers, containing one node each. Let us now take a look at its connections, starting with the strongest one. The edge connecting node 4 and 11 links the Y velocity to the second hidden node, which then ties to the vertical thrust. This setup allows the aircraft to decelerate its descent in proportion to its current velocity. The next strongest link connects the angle to the horizontal thrust. This is the same connection that Species Zero had in Generation 34, aiding the aircraft in maintaining balance. The third key connection ties the X velocity to the horizontal thrust, likely enabling controlled left and right steering. There are also some connections whose purpose is not immediately clear, like the one linking the bias and right leg to the first hidden node, which in turn influences the horizontal thrust. Similar to genetic traits in nature, these connections might not be immediately beneficial, but as long as they don't present a selective disadvantage, they may persist. And now, for the last time, let's launch the aircraft and witness the final result of the NEAT algorithm. The lunar lander gracefully approaches the moon's surface, its descent marked by meticulous precision and careful, fluid maneuvers. Every action is deliberate, culminating in a gentle, controlled touchdown precisely between the two flags. In this journey, over 52,200 individuals emerged and faded away. Eight distinct species engaged in a relentless struggle for supremacy in this virtual landscape. Innumerable mutations occurred. Countless genes were crossed. Now this individual represents the pinnacle of our evolutionary process. His architecture is a viable solution to this optimization problem, and the algorithm therefore concluded. Thank you for your attention.